post game. It's the Tiger Cats 32, the Toronto Argonauts 19. A seventh straight victory for the Tiger Cats on Labor Day. And how about this? Uh, I think an 11th straight win at Tim Hortons Field. Tiger Cats dominant at home. Louis B alongside Andy Fantuz. This is Tiger Cats post game. And, uh, I, 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 Dominant win, got a little iffy there at the end. Not even iffy, but a dominant win for the Thai Cats today. Certainly a win in all three phases of the game. And they, yeah, you, like you said, they the Argos put some off offensive production together in the fourth quarter, but let's not overshadow what really happened all game long. And uh, an excellent defensive performance for the Tiger Cats. And they got the job done. They were effective on offense, not over... Not an overpowering offensive product performance, but uh, certainly uh, with the defensive and special teams touchdown, getting it done in all three phases. Yeah, and let's look at the, some of the numbers here. Dane Evans, 21 of 29, 248 yards, two touchdowns, a solid performance for the second week in a row for number nine. Yes, very effective and efficient for Dane Evans. Uh, even a couple plays out there that could have been made by his receivers that didn't, didn't come down. So those numbers could have been even more impressive, but regardless, Effective completion, sorry, impressive completion percentage with the two touchdowns and most importantly, the big zero on the interception column. So uh, getting the, letting the, letting the other, other players on his team help him win the football game and not giving anything away, which is the most important thing right now. We got lots to come up here on Tiger Cats postgame exclusively on TigerCats.ca and the Tiger Cats All Access app. We're going to be joined by Coach O. We're going to be joined by Tim White, who scored his first career CFL touchdown today. Uh, we'll also get some postgame salutations with uh, Coach Sal, John Salavantis, some alumnus analysis with Bakari Grant, and we'll revisit your Car Star keys to victory. And we're also giving away a pair of gold seats to see the Tiger Cats take on the Stampeders on September 17th. That's the next home game. To enter, all you got to do is send us an email at gameday at ticats.ca. That's gameday at ticats.ca. Put the keyword caretaker in the subject line. Tell us your name, the city in which you live uh, inside the email, and it's that simple. If you're listening live on the stream, but also if you're listening to this on the podcast, uh, we'll do the draw tomorrow at noon. Uh, we'll make a random draw from all the entries, so good luck. Um, really, the defense here, dominant. Points in the fourth quarter aside, you know, uh, they weren't planning for McLeod Bethel Thompson, but he comes in, he puts up some decent numbers, 8 of 12 for 111 yards with a touchdown, including a nice play to to, to you know, keep their hopes alive for the Argos in the fourth quarter. But, I mean, the defense was really dominant from the very beginning. And the D-line was great, but a lot of love's got to be given to the linebackers here today. Yeah, when you're up by th three scores in the fourth quarter, you just have a tendency to kind of soften up a little bit, make sure you don't give up any really big plays. And that allows that allows the opposition to kind of dick and dunk and, and get downfield in, in, a, in a fairly timely manner and, and put some offensive um, yards up in the in the fourth. But don't take anything away from, from that, that linebacking crew. They were outstanding today. They shut down the run completely all game long. They, they I don't think they got any chunks more than three or four yards in, in the whole game uh, with John White or DJ Foster. So that's an impressive, um, making them one dimensional is, is the way you want to play defense against this Argonaut team. And they were effective doing that. Yeah, and, and really across the board, the Ticats defense, Jovan Santos Knox, eight tackles today. I mean, that's, that's just a big number for him. Uh, and then again, across the board, really everybody doing a, a great job. Frankie Williams had five tackles. I'm sure we're going to get to him in just a second. And, and again, Simone Lawrence with, the, you know, Joe Van Santos with the knockdown, Simone with the interception. I mean, I couldn't have scripted it any better. Simone Lawrence kind of sealing the deal in the fourth quarter on Labor Day. Who else but Simone? Yeah, it was. They were getting it from all angles, and uh, happy to see Simone get a highlight play because uh, he's been he's been really consistently terrific all season long. Just hasn't really had that stand that breakout or highlight play to to uh, get his name out there. But uh, he got it today, and with the help of his buddies, uh, 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 Tunde Adonkle get, getting the pressure. Javon Santos Knox getting the tip up and then Simone finishing the job and getting in the end zone and uh, and but he was flying around both all laterally across the field sideline to sideline making big hits 
making sure the uh, Argonaut receivers and ball carriers did not want to keep fighting for extra yards. So that's um, that's a stat that's not on the stat sheet that's very effective of his physical play. And again, I, I feel like Simone Lawrence maybe a couple years ago might have been frustrated that he wasn't showing up on the highlight reel. But I mean, that, that speaks to the, the veteran leadership that, that Simone has. Uh, you know, I don't want to say the maturity because Simone's always been a guy who's confident in his abilities, but he doesn't need to show up on the stat sheet anymore. I mean, he is the Ticats all-time leading tackler at this point, but again, like he's one of those guys that it's always nice to see him make a big play like that. Yeah, you and you could say you could say the maturity. I mean, he's uh, he's he's uh, you know he's always having fun. He's always out there. He's very vocal, and he's still vocal on the field. But he doesn't need that. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's he could see it's about the team and it's about the people around him, and you could see that that leadership of uh, it, it could, spreading across his teammates, which is which is great to see in the growth of him as a player. Can throw a couple of stats here at you. Um, Efficiency on second down. The Ticats were uh, 13 of 23 on second down for a conversion of 57. Something you and I talked about going into this game, how good the Ticats were doing second down defense. Uh, the Argos converting only 32% of their second downs. They were 8 of 25 on second down to get the first down. Again, that, that speaks to to really all aspects of the game. The you know Being able to kind of clog up the middle on, uh, on the D-line and then the way the secondary plays, the way the secondary plays, uh, it, it, hard to understate how well they've played all year long. Well, that's a recipe for a championship team right there. A championship defensive team is is getting off the field on second and down, not allowing those drives to continue and, uh, and staying fresh throughout the game, giving your offense more opportunities to, to uh, you know, have possession and drive down the, and put points on the board. So... That's a don't understate that that stat you just let, you just read off. If they can keep that up throughout the season, uh, they're they're going to be in great shape. Uh, if you got a question for Andy, now is your chance to ask Andy anything using Twitter or Instagram. Just use the hashtag triple A A A A, or you can email us at gameday at ticats.ca, and Andy will answer your questions today on Tiger Cats post game streaming live and only at ticats.ca and the Ticats All Access app. All right, let's get to our performer of the game in just a moment. Right now, very pleased to be joined by the head coach as we get exclusive access to the coaching room. Time to check in with Coach O, presented by Access Storage. And uh, Coach O, uh, a, a good-looking win uh, from the club here today. Yeah, it's uh, very very satisfying, not going to lie. I want the players to And the execution was outstanding. Very proud of them. I uh, want everybody to enjoy it. For This is for the city of Hamilton, too. It's just uh, our football team. This is a long time coming for the city of Hamilton. Yeah, Coach, it was great to see the fans and the excitement in the stadium and a couple key key plays to, uh, to get that crowd excited. I thought the team was very well disciplined in the first half, and it slipped a little bit in the second half, and then in the fourth quarter, allowing the Argonauts to put together some offensive production. Yeah, you know. With that being said, I know we're up. Know you're up by three scores, so you're kind of tend to fall back a bit. But do you are you uh, concerned with any momentum going into that second game uh, with that scrum at the end, and then the, the fourth quarter production for the Argos and and the and the penalties in the second half? Yeah, right now, you know, if we don't let anybody get in our joy bucket. Wins are hard to come by, so we'll we'll evaluate uh, everything that uh, we know we got to get better at. But right now. I want everybody to enjoy this. You, you kind of you've mentioned that a few times. Like, can you just put it into perspective just how hard it is to win in football? I mean, there's always going to be a winner. There's always going to be a loser. But to put it into perspective from the coaching room, just how hard is it to win games in this league? It's extremely hard. I mean, put every every week, so everybody prepares the same, and and half the teams lose. Period. And that's across North America. Every football game that's played, high school, college, and pro. Well, we both know that uh, Friday, four days away, will be a completely different game, but enjoy the win, Coach. Excellent job, all three phases, and uh, proud of you guys. Thank you very much. That is Coach O, exclusive access to the coaching room, presented by Access Storage, and uh, we'll be joined by Tim White in just a second. And how about that? Because it seems like every day, every game, there's a different receiver stepping up, and when you're missing Devere Posey, when you're missing Braylon Addison, how important is that, that it's not just one guy you can rely on, 
it's any guy you can rely on any week. The teams that are always the most successful offensively spread the ball around. And you don't have three or four guys on that stat sheet. You're going to have six, seven, eight targets hit by the quarterback. And they're starting to see those those players other than the obvious ones like the Brandon Banks of the world that are stepping up and becoming c c stables in this offense. And then when you get those, when you get the Devere Poseys and the Braylon Addisons coming back from injury, that's a good problem to have when, you, when you're going to be competing for the job, competing for balls, uh, targets on the field. And that's just, that's, a, that's, a, that's what creates a, an effective offensive unit. And how about the way they use their receivers on kind of these these runs, these design runs, we talked about with Speedy at the half where, you know, you got to get him going so you use these runs. But, uh, you know, Speedy B had five carries for 31 yards. Uh, Tim White was even getting involved with some rushers. How, that versatility on your offense. And, again, we're expecting kind of a, maybe a bigger game from Sean Thomas Shillington. But, uh, you know, on the ground, they, they seem to have got the job done finishing the game with uh, 78 rushing yards. And in a game like this, I don't think you can be too upset with that. Yeah, it was a lot, more, a lot more effective getting those wide receiver runs and those misdirection plays uh, today than it was in, in the past games. And that was great to see because it really keeps the defense on their heels instead of just pinning their ears back and getting upfield. So if you're able to get some chunks of yards when you have the receivers flashing by the quarterback laterally, it creates a whole new dynamic in your offense that the defense has to respect and it gives you more... Uh, gives you gives you more versatility I guess I already said that word but but uh, so being a having that as an effective part of your game just opens up your playbook even more uh, did the win play as big of a factor as you were expecting it to and that's the, that's a great point that's what I think that's what a lot of me there like when you have the win you're not sure where the ball fight's gonna be picking up those chunks in those uh, more sharp kind of plays those those run plays and short passes it, it, it helps gain your offensive rhythm, and then you're allowed to take shots downfield. But did the wind play as big of a part? Well, it certainly played a part on some of those throws. You could see it, but it was almost uh, swaying in all different directions. So it wasn't necessarily overthrows or underthrows, but some of them were. Some of the throws were kind of moving laterally as the as the ball flight was going downfield. Um, but I gotta say, the punt game was really impressive. But both sides of the ball, uh, you know. The, the actual punting was really impressive on both sides of the ball. And I did want to get to a couple other stats here that kind of uh, uh, caught my eye. Uh, gross punting average for the Ticats and Argonauts was pretty even. 43.4 for the uh, Argos, 46.2 for the Ticats. And the Frankie Williams return definitely helped this. But the uh, net punting average for the Ticats, 42 yards. For the Argos, 28 yards. Yeah, I mean, when your punting average is 43 and your net is 42, I mean, that's incredible coverage downfield. Credit to Jeff Reinbow and his special teams unit. Uh, just a well-oiled machine right there. Whitford was not only kicking it deep, but getting that hang time, allowing the coverage team to get down there, get in their proper lanes, surround the ball, uh, the, the the ball returner, and and that that's just a, a recipe for a successful net punting average. All right, now we go down to the locker room and connect with Tim White. This exclusive post-game interview presented by Access Storage. Uh, Tim, what's the mood in the locker room after a win like that? Uh, definitely big excitement. Um, you know, but it's still focused. You know, we, we understand what we have coming up in the next few days. So we're just trying to stay locked in, but we're definitely excited about this point. Tim, Andy Fantuz here. I want to just touch on your touchdown catch for a second. Uh, it was one of those balls where sometimes you'll see a receiver sort of do the, I call it the Frankenstein, and they run with their arms down and they can't quite get there. But you did... And I'm sure Tommy Condell coached this into you. Took those extra two steps and those late Cobra hands nice and low to uh, just snag it with your fingertips. It was uh, very impressive from my viewpoint. And just walk me through that play. Right. I mean, it's a play we've been working on all week. And uh, we just wanted to come out there and execute. And we got the look that we wanted. So uh, just glad we were able to take advantage of it. Uh, I just told myself, you know, while I was running it out, just, Stay patient. You know, I knew I had another gear that I could tap into if the ball was over on, and we had the wind to our back. So, you know, I just told myself to stay calm, stay patient, and track the ball, and that's exactly what I, was, what I did. I was just happy to be able to high-step into the end zone. 
Tim, what did it mean to score that touchdown? I mean, you, you've got an incredible story, um, and I encourage anyone to, to kind of check it out. For you to get that pro touchdown in this building at home, to get that reaction of the crowd, what, what did that moment mean to you? Yes, it, it definitely meant a lot. You know, I've been waiting for this moment for a minute, and, you know, just to be able to share that moment with my teammates, with the fans and the stands, and be at home for my first touchdown, it was just something I, you know, it, it definitely meant a lot to me, and I look forward to a lot more of that. Tim, you were getting it done on all all areas of the field with rushes and catches and uh, had a lot more targets this game, and it's nice to see the Tiger Cats spreading the ball around. Can you just talk a little bit about... Uh, you know, when you when everybody's sort of pitching in, how much, how much, how much bigger the pie gets, and how much more successful you are as a unit. Right. I think I think that's exactly what it is. Uh, uh, trust with our offensive coordinator, and then trust with Dane. You know, spreading the ball out. I think that is something that really matters. So being able to just be a contribute to that is a big factor, and it's going to open a lot of guys up. It's going to open Speedy up, and we're just going to continue to play as a unit. Obviously a quick turnaround, but enjoy the victory uh, today, tonight, and uh, we'll see you back at the practice field this week. Thanks, Tim. Will do. Thank you for having me. And that is Tim White. And, uh, I mean, it seems like every week we're talking about this is, okay, it's another chance for another guy to make their case that once Devere Posey, once Braylon Addison, that wide receiver room is going to get pretty packed pretty quickly. Uh, it, it certainly is. And uh, to me, today's performance offensively, was more impressive than the Montreal performance uh, and for a couple reasons and and one is they were dealing with this swirling wind and there were a few plays out there that were I mean there were sure, sure there was in Montreal too but a few more plays out there that were missed and when you have a stat line uh, like Dayan Evans uh, uh, that completion percentage just the uh, efficient efficient and effective to me they, they, they're growing in the right direction. They they're have that foundation, and they're able to build and make improvements on it. And once those other guys get back, uh, watch out. Watch out for the rest of the CFL. Uh, before we get to Bakari Grant, before we get to Coach Sal, let's name our performer of the game. And it's presented by Hercules Tire right on strength. A um, couple of guys we could have chosen from. A couple of guys we were talking about in the fourth quarter, but we decided to go with... We decided to go with Frankie Williams. And I'll tell you why. He had that, I mean, everyone saw the amazing kick ret or punt return touchdown that really opened up the game. It was kind of stale, 10-4 game at the time, and then that, that really opened it up and, uh, in, and created a momentum swing that the Tiger Cats just snowballed into, into a dominant performance. And not only that play, but look at him on the defensive side of the ball. Not only had, did he have five tackles and, and, a, and a pass deflection, but he... He also had to move positions in the middle of the game. Siante Evans went down with an injury, so he had to move into that into that field halfback slot, and uh, just like like nothing, just moved in and and uh, and and shut down shut, and shut play shut down defense from there. So Frankie Williams, hats off to you. Uh, second game in a row for the performer of the game. Yeah, a couple of honorable mentions. You know, I were talking about maybe Joel Whitford. You know, first game in this stadium with this wind, he was pretty effective. Uh, you know, last couple of punts aside, I, I think he did a pretty good job. And even Dane Evans, one of those guys who could have been uh, named. And Simone Lawrence had a fantastic game, finishing with six points there on the uh, the pick six. Yeah, Joel Whitford and, and Dane were my audible mentions. Uh, the it's not easy to get that 42 net average and uh, it, to ha have the ball hang up there in, in this win for that long. Allow your coverage team to get down there and swarm the returner. Um, hats off, great great performance in your first Labor Day Classic, first game at Tim Hortons Field, and uh, you never know. Like I mean, every everywhere you look in the stadium, the flags are blowing in different directions. So. <laughs> It's hard to uh, it's hard to account for that on the field, but he did a great job. And, and Dane again, solid, uh, efficient, and effective performance. We're giving away a pair of gold seats to see the Tie Cats take on the Stampeders on September 17th. That's the next home game here at Tim Hortons Field. You can send us an email at gameday at tiecats.ca. That's gameday at tiecats.ca. Put the keyword caretaker in the subject line. Tell us your name, the city you live in, in the email, and it's that simple. And to allow those who are listening live on the stream as well is in podcast form to enter. The entry deadline is noon tomorrow at at noon tomorrow, which is the 7th, and we'll randomly pick a drop from all entries, so good luck on that one. All right, time to get to our post-game salutations. 
with Coach John Salavantis. Coach Sal, a uh, pretty, pretty good win for the Ticats here today. I thought it was a great win. You know, when your defense plays the way they did, and I thought Luke uh, Tasker set it up very well. When you can score on defense, score on offense, and score on special teams, you're hard to beat. And and in your home field, those are things that uh, really go to the front. And and I, I, I go back to what uh, you were talking about with Frankie Williams having to change positions. You know, uh, the uh, Arbuckle had trouble throwing to the wide side of the field. And I think part of that problem was that Roll and Frankie Williams were over on that side of the field for most of the game. And it really cut down the, uh, his ability to get the ball to the outside. Yeah, Coach, we were talking about it, and uh, you were surprised that they weren't picking on the weak side a little bit, or at least at least not picking on it, but at least trying to test it. Um, Talk a little about that. What do, you, what do you think? When you well, get a new guy coming in, why wouldn't they go there? If you're the offensive uh, coordinator and you're the quarterback and a new guy comes into the ball game via injury, you go after him. You, you try to test him because he's a substitute. He's not the number one player. So uh, I was very surprised they didn't go to the short side of the field more and attack uh, uh on Lawrence, Desmond Lawrence, but Lawrence played well over there, and Corral Brooks, he got the interception on that side of the field, too. So, uh, kudos to the secondary and, and the way they played today. I thought they did a great job. Yeah, I mean, how hard is it to play one dimensional football? Has the Tiger Cats completely shut down the Argonaut run, running game after when they played against one of the best run defenses in the league and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, sort of getting it done in every single way? Uh, running and two two running backs and then the short throws there wasn't really any of that available today and um you know how hard is it just to play one-dimensional football it, it, it's very difficult on the offensive side i thought teddy laurent on the inside and win on the inside made a difference in the ball game you saw hauser and uh Jagera davis both make tackles coming down the line of scrimmage from the back side uh, before the runner could ever reach the line of scrimmage. And a lot of that is because your two inside players are eating up all the blockers and there's no one to take care of that outside guy. Yeah, you said it. I was loving how the, the defensive, like Mark Washington, was scheming it up so that just like you said, the the end was shooting straight down the line to get the running back, but they also had the uh, the Sam or the Will, whatever side it was, kind of looping around to make sure that the run pass option wasn't there. And that's really the pressure on that quarterback where he's got that split second and he's just got to hand it off and take a one- or two-yard gain instead of uh, having a chance to roll out and create Yeah, I, I, I thought Toronto would come in with the RPO uh, offense, you know, the Arbuckle, Dinwiddie, coming out of the Calgary-type uh, offense. Offense. But we didn't see that today, and I think a lot of it was because of the scheme that was employed by the uh, Tiger Cat defense. I just want to talk about the secondary uh, a little bit more. You talked about, you know, obviously Siante Evans didn't see much in the second half. Um, you know, Desmond Lawrence wasn't being tested, but uh, Jamal Roll had four knockdowns. Uh, Simone had a knockdown. Joe Van Santos knocks that. What does that do to a quarterback when they are throwing the ball up, you know, these jump balls, and they're losing them time after time again? Well, not only the jump balls, uh, Louis, but also the throws to the outside in the flat areas where they were trying to get the uh, the flat throw to the wide side of the field. And Roll was there every time. Now, we all have all thought we would miss Delvin Bro. I think Roll has taken that position and, and will do extremely well in that position given the fact that he can play both the short side of the field and the wide side of the field, and I thought he proved that today. Yeah, you can't. I mean, it's hard to replace a guy like Delvin Bro, but a different kind of look and a different scheme can be just as effective with different personnel, and uh, Roll's doing a great job of that. Uh, certainly, and we were chatting about this during the game. Like you mentioned, the wide side short throws. Uh, I thought both teams were testing the waters there. And uh, you know, Dexter McCoyle Jr. He he just uh, he just missed a pick six right through his hands for the Argonauts. But um, the, I don't know what they're what the quarterback's thinking on a windy day like this, throwing it 50 yards, 50 yards for a five yard gain. Uh, that's that's just a big no no in my books. I agree with that, and it, and also to go back to the Hamilton offense, I, I thought uh, in this ball game that Banks took the top off the defense several times. I mean, he can run through the defense. That opens up 
those other throws uh, inside, uh, you know, where you uh, an in cut, uh, for example, uh, on the 20, 25 yard uh, area. And I, and I think Banks, you know, he, I don't want to say he dropped a couple. He missed a couple that were catchable balls in that ball game, won them for a touchdown. But I think the fact that he's got so much speed that he takes a top off the defense makes the other things happen for the tight cats. Yeah, I love watching him run. He's just so smooth out there, and you know he's got that extra gear in him. Uh, but even at his, as a, in a tempo, quote-unquote tempo pace, I mean, he's still one of the fastest players on the field. And then when he kicks it up into that last gear, He's going to separate from anybody. And um, that was similar to the Tim White touchdown, really. Uh, both those guys were wide open downfield. And, uh, and then he just, Tim just was able to kick it into extra gear and, and, and chase down that football. Just to stay with the receivers, I, David Ungur has started at the wide receiver every game this season. He's, he's the Canadian. You need him out there for the ratio. How, how good was it to see him? score though and not just score but scoring a great effort you know it, it was okay is he going to get the first down okay then he got the first down okay is he going to get the touchdown and then he got the touchdown I mean for him personally not to be just the token Canadian receiver but to actually contribute the way he did it's got to feel good for him and for Tommy Condell in the offense I, I liken that to when we used to play with a fullback and every so often you have to give him a bone <laughs> so that he can get a run in there and I think Unger today, he knows he's not going to get a lot of balls thrown his way. So when he did get one, he wanted to make sure that, it, that he was able to dot the I and get in the touchdown. In an impressive fashion. Like, what a stiff arm. Just throwing that guy right to the ground. And, uh, and yeah, you just made me chuckle there because I always loved, like, those workhorses, those role players on your team, giving them a bone, as you called it. But getting them involved in a game, and especially in these big games like this, it, it just creates so much excitement across the entire offensive unit. And uh, so I was just so happy for, for uh, Unger there. And I, I want to get back to what you were talking about, about when you can stretch that field vertically, it kind of creates those... You call them almost like a dig post read, but basically you're over and undering a player at some point in the field. And I saw we saw a lot of that today, not only from the strong side of the field, but also coming across the field. And one of those was the speedy catch uh, down here on the near side of the numbers where we had sort of both those guys coming in the middle. Uh, and I think it was Acklin kind of cutting across around that 20 yard mark and then speedy going deeper. And yes, he wanted a deeper ball, but uh, but like you said, it was, a, it was a play to make. But when you have that speed where you can get to that second level that fast with the speedies and the Tim Whites uh, on your field, it gives, it's a huge advantage as an offense, right? Yeah, and it opens up the slot backs, a big slot back like yourself or a Mike Morreale, uh when he played a, a Ray Elgard, a Rocky Di Pietro, those double crosses in the middle where you got a short slot going one side at about the 10 yard uh, level and then you got the deeper guy going across at 18 yards and and you're layering the position of the receivers for your quarterback so if the safety does this you go short if the safety does that you go deep uh with the win and the way it all works out, the Thai Cats move into a three-way tie for first. Uh, it's it's so early. I mean, it is Labor Day. Season starts Labor Day, but it's game four of a 14-game schedule. Is there some sort of mental aspect of seeing your name at the top of the standings and not wanting to let go? I mean, even early on, or are you not really paying attention to the, the individual standings at this point? Well, we always talk in the locker room about don't worry about where you are in a position uh, in terms of first, second, third, whatever. It's do you make the playoffs? And if you get in the playoffs, do you play well enough that you move on to the Grey Cup? And to have Hamilton uh, in a position to have the Grey Cup at home for the first time in so many years, I think it's super important that, uh, and O will do this, Coach O will do this, he'll keep his guys level and not, not looking ahead to the next play, uh, 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 play, I say play, game. Yeah. You know, you've got to play each game one at a time. It's the same mindset, though, right? It's it's not looking ahead to, okay, it, you know, we're up by 20 in the third quarter. How are we going to finish it off in the fourth? Andy, you and I were talking about that watching the game when we were. It's like, okay, like, do you keep that momentum going? Like, what's being said? And it's like, it's really not that big picture. It's more, 
what are we going to do the next time we're on the field? Yeah, you just execute one play after another, and when things are going well, it just seems like seems like it's easier to execute. But uh, to touch on your point there, Coach, um, I do think with the Ticats in particular – and having 11 straight wins at home, that they are going to want to shoot for that first place in the East and get that playoff by and have two games here to win the championship instead of having to go on the road. Uh, but I couldn't agree with you more that you're not looking at the standings. You're not thinking of next next game. Uh, or sorry, you're not thinking past next game. But um, but you certainly, I would say that it's going to be a goal to, to finish the season in first place in the East and have that bye week to rest rest your bodies and then have a home game. Sure. What you're talking about are short-term goals and long-term goals. When you come in in the beginning of the year, your long-term goal is the Grey Cup. You want to be in the Grey Cup. You want to win the Grey Cup. But your short-term goal is to win the games at home and to get yourself in the playoff position for number one where you can get a rest and get into your, your playoff uh, picture. Uh, if you've got a question for Andy, you can ask Andy anything using the hashtag AAA on uh, Twitter. Ticats win the 50th Labor Day Classic. Uh, big win, and like I said, moved to 2-2. Two and two, uh, Tied for first, a three-way tie for first in the East. But, I mean, those first two games, and I asked Coach after game one and, you know, kind of again after game two, not having a preseason, like just how difficult it is to measure. And, you know, he wasn't making excuses other teams didn't have preseason either. But looking back on those games one and two, do, do they feel more preseason-like compared to what we've seen the last two weeks? I would say that I thought initially that the, pre the, the early games would be like preseason games. One of the things we don't talk about a lot is the fact that they're, they're practicing without pads totally. And your offensive, defensive lines, it's very important for them early on to get in the hitting mode, to be able to take on the physical play. And, and without preseason games and without pads, I think that's the most difficult part uh, that you see. And I see today, for example, I didn't think the Toronto offensive line played very well. I thought they played okay, but not to a standard where you're going to win football games with that. I thought Hamilton's offensive line has improved from game one to now. You've got two Americans playing on the right side, Yarborough and Murray. Keep them there. Make them play. Learn to play. Okafer played much better this time at the left tackle position. So you're beginning to get that cohesiveness that you need in an offensive line in order to pro uh, progress. Yeah, just absolutely, like you said, absolutely dominant team win. Uh, Jeff Reinbold already on Twitter. Uh, huge T-E-A-M win in front of the best fans in the CFL. I am really proud of our men and the effort and preparation they gave to get ready for the Labor Day Classic. Uh, the, the tricky part is now, you're going to play again in four days. Right, I mean that is a quick turnaround for for these guys who really left it all out on the field. How how do they approach this week? What does this week look like? This week looks like any other week, as long as the coaches maintain the position that they have all along. We've got to get ready to play. Now we've already played this team, so we have a book on them. They have a book on us. If we make too many changes, we're not doing what we want to do. You've got to continue to do what you want to do on offense and what you want to do on defense. Don't make adjustments thinking they're thinking that we're thinking that we're going to make a change. Don't. Just do what you do and do it well, and you're, you're okay. And, and just as, as we uh, talk about going to Toronto, let's give a shout-out to, to Mike Hogan, who's the play-by-play -play guy for, for the uh, Toronto Argonauts. And he has a saying that he always uses when he comes here for Labor Day. <laughs> and that is that the best thing he knows about Hamilton is seeing it in the rearview mirror. <laughs> well, Hoagie, when you cross that Skyway Bridge today, look off to your left and see where all that steel came from that built that town of Toronto. And enjoy your way. And, and, and you and I were talking about that this week. Um, I mean, Labor Day is Labor Day, but especially in this city. 
especially having this game here, a city, like you said, all that those steel mills, a city that was built on unions. I mean, it really does add a little extra specialness to, to wins here on this day. It goes back to the history of it. When you go back to the eras where Mosca and Henley and, and uh, Zuger and, and Ellison Kelly and, and Don Southern, those guys worked part-time in order to play football. And a lot of them worked in those steel mills. So they got the idea right away that the hard hats and the labor people were the foundation of the community of Hamilton. And that's something that, I mean, you can say it better in the locker room, but, uh, I mean, it it's not just cliche. Like, it isn't, like, it to, to buy into what is, good, like, you know, to use the term blue collar, to, you know, put on your hard hats, bring your lunch pals. It, I've seen it here with this team that's been around forever, but I've also seen it with, like, Forge FC and the soccer team that plays out of this building. You really do buy into this community, and maybe it's making that drive every day. Maybe it's practicing here with the steel mills in the background, but there is something that's hardened in you once you you get to Hamilton. Yeah, that's an incredible story, and, and you're right. It's a, it is a the atmosphere and experience of playing here and coming into the city and and uh, is is incredible, and I just... You know, I just like pray and hope that we can, that the city of Hamilton can enjoy a proper Grey Cup experience. Uh, not only the game itself, but just all everything that comes with it. Um, you know, it's been a long time coming, a long time waiting, and and the preparations have been have been outstanding. And the, like, you know, obviously the, the environment here is incredible. So I just. I just hope that uh, we can live it up to the fullest. To that point, I mean, 15,000 today really did sound like 28,000, 30,000. Like, we, it, it, they'd felt it, and, and we could feel it in the stands, and you know the players felt it on the field. They, they certainly did, and that, that brings us to the point where Hamiltonians get out and get vaccinated so that we can fill the stadium. If, if October comes and we're still reluctant people about vaccination, it's not going to be the same atmosphere. Get out, get vaccinated, and get ready to come here and enjoy the Grey Cup. Absolutely well said. Um, final thoughts, Coach, on uh, what we saw here today. Well, I, I think we're progressing well. I, I think we're, uh, we're advancing on the offensive side. We got a lot more solid on the special teams uh, in the last three weeks. I think Ryan Bold always does a great job there, but it's hard when you're changing personnel. Now, personnel is pretty well set for what's going to happen, by, except for injuries, obviously, but the personnel are there. Uh, the the atmosphere for the players here at Tim Hortons Field is good. The coaching staff is, is locked in on what they want to do. I think nothing but the best can come again. Well said. Coach Sal, thanks for joining us. You're more than welcome, guys. <laughs> thanks, Coach. Uh, hey, if you missed some of tonight's uh, post game, you can catch up on all the analysis from me and Andy Fantuz in podcast form. It's a great way to get your morning rolling after every game. And you can do it tomorrow. Find it under Ticats Audio Network wherever you get your podcasts. A uh, great day down here at the field. The final 32-19 to 19 for the Hamilton Tire Cats. And discuss it a little bit further. Let's bring in Bakari Grant. And uh, Bakari, uh, watching that game from beginning to end, uh, your thoughts on uh, the way the Tie Cats played today. Man, man, man. It's not too much that makes you miss football, but uh... – Labor Day Classic like that is awesome. It, you know, it was a, a little uh, a little bit of a slow start, but what was exciting to see was defense flying around, special teams flying around, offense getting it together, and and it's no better way to play a, to play a Labor Day Classic than than that right there. Bakari, don't you just love those games where there's that extra little nonsense going on pregame? Like I don't know if you saw that, but little little pushing and shoving pregame, and then uh, and then lots of lots of extracurriculars happening throughout the game. But it, doesn't it fire you up as a player? You know what's interesting is if you watch the game, and I watched a little bit, and, and granted, I'm biased. You know, I'm, I'm a tight cat at heart, but uh, <laughs> it's it's fun to see this stuff, but. What's really fun is when you're between the lines, between the whistles, and you're hitting people in the mouth. And that's what I saw from the tight cast today. It was, you know, they responded a little bit to the, the ticky tacky stuff, but it was guys, you know, hitting people in the mouth while the play was going on, making plays. And, and that, that's what gets me excited is, you know, we got pads on and helmet on for a reason. And 
most guys know I, I'm, a, I'm a blocker and I like to hit and I like the contact and that's where I, that's where I really enjoy today. How much did you love Ungver's touchdown there? A guy who, uh, you know, in our days we had we had our Matt Coaches of the world and uh, the guys who would do a lot for the offensive production with with the blocking and and uh, and you know creating space for other players and then to get a chance to to catch a ball and then that stiff arm, uh, you know, how excited would you get if we were in that huddle with those guys? Man, that like you say, you, every team has those guys who are just kind of those unsung heroes in, in some respect. But you know, to see them come out and put in the work every day, and then like you said, to come back, kind of redemption for Speedy's head, give him a stiff arm, and then fight for the end zone. That that gets you pumped up, man. Hey, the one thing, Andy, and I, I know you'll relate to this, that uh, two point conversion by Jalen Acklin. Uh, you know, he goes to throw the ball in stands and he fumbles a little bit. I, you know what I think they need to bring back is that punt, man. <laughs> we, between 2012 and 2015, we must have punted 100 balls into the uh, stands. And, oh. man, hey, I'd love to see it come back. Uh, a- Andy, I, I will let you know that Andy was uh, mumbling under his breath to me that, uh, you know, you don't get stat credits for uh, two-point conversions. Was that something <laughs> that always bothered you as a receiver? <laughs> Hey, yeah, it did, you right? Because you still feel good about it. You're in the end zone, but you're like, ah, it's not going to show up. But, you know, it's still a big part of the game. And if you, you know, watch the game close, it makes a big difference. So, hey, punt that ball into the stands next time, Jalen. Man, yeah. make, it, make, make a difference. Boot that thing over the whistle, <laughs> over the strictly steam whistle. Oh man, they, yeah. And so I want to talk about the Tim White touchdown a second. We were we were discussing it with him, and how many times does Tommy Condell preach late hands and and Cobra hands? And 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 for the people that maybe I don't know what that means is, you know, we call you run with if you run with your hands out, you run like a Frankenstein, and and it slows you down. But if you take that one extra step that you don't think you can, and then you shoot your hands out like a Cobra, nice and low, uh, you'll be surprised how much more distance you can catch a, you can you can um, make up to catch the ball and and into the with the wind like that that was a throw where I was watching I'm thinking oh geez keep going keep going keep going and and he, he did that what did you think about that play oh man it was so good it was so awesome um you know like you said a lot of those small details that people don't necessarily get a chance to really understand is you know when, when Andy talks about those late hands is you, a lot of people see that fingertip catch or, you know, that, that diving catch, and it's really push, push, push that last second, and then you shoot those hands straight to where the ball is going to get to. And like you said, it can, you know, you can get about three extra yards, which, you know, with, with that wind in that stadium, uh, you know, most people know I caught the first touchdown on Labor Day, but what they don't know is I also dropped the first touchdown. <laughs> and it was the first time – that I got to experience the wins. It was a corner route, and I think the ball is coming a perfect drop, and then it instantly stops and just starts dropping, and I have to try to get back to it. So that, that's a big deal in that uh, Hamilton Stadium. You know, the donut box is a, a big home field advantage because if you can understand those wins, whether it's the kicking game, deciding whether to defer or take the ball or take the wind at your back. Those things make a big difference there. Uh, we're getting some alumnus analysis with our friend Bakari Grant here on Tiger Cats postgame. And, I mean, I just don't want to stay on the receivers because it, when you have guys who can produce every game, like, you know, Jalen Acklin with the huge game, game one, uh, Stephen Dunbar Jr. last week, and now uh, Tim White kind of leading the way. What does that do for a room where it's really just like it's, it's, not, it's not star dominated? It's really anybody can go on any given night. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a momentum builder. And, you know, the way I know Tommy's running his room over there is, is guys get excited when other guys make plays. You'll see them tap each other on the head or, you know, uh, celebrate with each other. And like uh, Andy alluded to, you know, when you got guys like Unger scoring touchdowns and you see the whole team come over and pat them on the head and celebrate with them, I mean, it's huge. And for a quarterback, you know, yeah, you want that those stars to be able to make plays, but – when you have the opportunity to spread the ball and have, you know, so many playmakers. And like we talked about last week in Montreal, we still got guys who are, you know, star studded, you know, that aren't even on the field yet. So it's, it's a fun game to watch, man. Yeah. Getting the job done in uh, three phases of the game, scoring defense, special teams, and on offense, like uh, coach Allen, our boy, Luke Tasker, 
mentioned. Hard hard to beat a team like that. And you know what? One thing I was really impressed with in the first half was uh, it seemed like every time you turn around, the Argonauts are taking an unnecessary roughness or a personal foul of some kind. And the Tiger Cats just completely disciplined. And that was great to see. And it evened up a little bit near the end there. But, uh, you know, when you're getting those, those, those chunks of yards that – aren't necessarily earned, uh, makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? Yeah, and and like uh, Jeff Reinbold, Coach Reinbold on Twitter mentioned it, that, that was a full team win. And what, what you love to see is, Andy, when you have the defense make a big play and then the special team scores a touchdown and then you get a turnover on downs and then the offense takes a big shot for a 50-yard touchdown, when you're able to really build on that momentum and and – and execute, you know, after the other side of and it's that that's fun football, you know. That's when when guys ask you what you miss about the game, you miss games like that where everything's rolling and you can get excited about those, you know, special teams plays and defensive plays. So awesome team win. Bakari, always love catching up with you. I can't wait to hear what you have to say next game. I appreciate it, guys. Louie, Andy, I uh, can't uh, look forward to it. Absolutely. Later, brother. Uh, alumnus analysis with Bakari Grant, and uh, you know we're just sitting here laying back. It's, it's amazing how, I don't want to say how quickly it empties out, but just how efficient it is. And now we're looking at this beautiful stadium. Hard to believe, you know, half an hour ago, it was packed to the, you know, to the roof here, 15,000 people. And, and, I mean, to that point, these fans, like everybody's been through a lot, and we were had we uh, we were here early putting the towels in. I mentioned that already, uh, which but we had a big staff meeting, and like all the people who who work for the tie full time tie cat staffs, you know, and our, our boss kind of pointed out something. He's like, we've all been through a lot, personally, professionally, you know, like it. It, it this is a trying time, and for for Tiger Cats fans to be able to come here, for our season seat holders to be able to sit in their seats. You know, maybe seats they've had since this place is open where the Ticats have never lost a game on Labor Day. Like, it's hard to put into words just just, just what it meant for all of us to, to have this collective feeling of uh, just a normalcy might not even be the word, people wearing masks still. It's But as close to normal as we've been in a long time. Yeah, the energy was incredible here. Driving into the city, coming into the stands, seeing it fill, fill up with people. Then you get the... Then you get the fireworks show and the snowbirds flying over twice, and the the new anthem singer was fantastic. Oh, little, uh, amazing! Yeah, a little seven. When year she old hit that high <laughs> note on the uh, on the other the coming back on the big finish there, just unbelievable. And uh, and credit to to the fans. It was only a t- 10-4 game, a little bit of a slow game, but they stayed in it. And then once uh, once Frankie Williams blew it open with that punt return touchdown, um, it was just electric in here. And uh, what a yeah, great place to play. Huge advantage for the team, but uh, just you know, in, in Hamilton, that that sense of what you know, what we've been missing—that yeah. unity and that togetherness—that's a great word. And this, really. I mean, this team, this city, this building, like everything, just kind of came together, and it, and it ended with a win. And you know, that's you know, if you're someone who visualizes things, like yes, December twelfth will not be as beautiful as it is today with the sunshine. Uh, who knows? But it, I it wouldn't expect it to be as uh, as nice here. But uh, all right, let's uh, let's revisit our car star keys to victory and uh, tie cats for, again. They they must put it on in the locker room before the game. They must they must be listening, especially the last two weeks here as uh, we revisit our car star keys to victory. Uh, let's revisit number one. What did we have? Number one was starting field position, and that one is a big win, and uh, you couldn't ask for much more. So the Toronto Argonauts started average on their own 25-yard line with seven starts inside their own 20. So that is a long field to work with. Hamilton, on the other hand, started average on their own 38-yard line with six starts from at least their own 40. And that's not even including the punt return touchdown and the interception for a touchdown that are just automatic points. So that is, uh, it's hard to even put it in words how much of a difference that is. And a lot of that with those penalties in the first half uh, and that excellent punting by Joel Whitford. But managing this wind and controlling that field position battle, huge, huge win and uh, very impressive. And I, not 
uh, we'll get to it in a second, so I won't spoil it. But uh, the Carriel Brooks with an un unbelievable play. It just seems like every week we have a, a highlight reel catch, and I didn't want to step on your toe there, but I just thought of it, and uh, it was early on, and you almost forgot about it. But just a great play. All right, Car Star Key to Victory. Uh, we'll give them uh, a check, a plus. I forgot the grading system we've decided <laughs> to use, but yeah. uh, A plus, keep, right? Yeah, A plus. All we right, th two thumbs up. Two I thumbs don't know. up. There we go. We gotta get it. We gotta yeah, get we'll figure it yeah. out. Uh, <laughs> this is Tiger Cats post game. Uh, he's Andy Fantuz. I'm Louis B. All right, that was Car Star Key to Victory number one. What do we have for Key to Victory number two? Number two was pressure the quarterback, and this came in many different ways. The Tiger Cats had three sacks. However, they completely, as Coach Sell mentioned, they completely shut down that RPO offense that was so effective for the Toronto Argonauts last game, and they did that by allowing the defensive ends, Hauser, Davis, Bennett, shoot down the line of scrimmage and just go straight for the running back and have the linebacker looping around for the quarterback, which makes it incredibly difficult for the quarterback to make that read. And if he's not going to have time to pull it and throw it, you got to hand it off, and uh, the Argos were only getting two yards on those type of plays. So combine that with the three sacks that came in crucial points in the game, um, the one in particular right after the Argos had – two of their most effective plays up until the fourth quarter, uh, and then just to completely get that sack to force the punt. Um, I'm going to give that one a thumbs up as well. So great job. And that, I mean, uh, pressure the quarterback. Uh, I'm thinking a very specific play. They won't get credit for a sack, but it did create some pressure and did create uh, something that we needed, something that for number three, uh, our Car Star Keys victory, we're revisiting. Yeah, exactly. Tanae Kelleke just... just running down uh, Arbuckle on that last play to force him to try to throw this little dinky pass over top of uh, Santos Knox, who got a hand on it. Simone ended up picking it up for one of the turnovers. So Carstar, key to victory number three. Win the turnover battle, three to zero. Another very impressive, dominating win for the key to victory number three. Win the turnover battle. Um, yeah, you... That that pick on the sideline, Carol Brooks, yeah. is super impressive. And they kind of got tangled up with the receiver. Uh, the receiver fell down. Curio was stumbling, able to get his feet, dive for the ball, and it, I think his feet left the ground before he caught it. But he was able to just tap him down right on the sideline, right before the uh, the the white stripe, uh, before he hit the ground. And what an amazing pick! And then of course that exciting play uh, right near the end zone there, uh, three zero. So three thumbs up for the keys to victory and uh, and a big impressive win on the scoreboard. Well said. 32-19 the final. And, uh, well, if the Ticats want to keep the momentum going or if the Argos want to get some revenge, we won't have to wait long as these two teams will see each other at BMO Field in just a, a few short days on Friday night. And uh, we'll get you set for that one. We'll be on the air at 6 o'clock with Tiger Cats pregame, me and Andy, and uh, we'll hand it off to RJ and Luke, who will have the call. Uh, make sure to listen to Ty Cats Audio Network work all week long we'll have some great shows uh we'll be joining of course task and twos the coach o show we're getting that ready for tomorrow so lots of great stuff to talk about here on the tie cats audio network if you missed any of the post game make sure to subscribe to the tie cats audio network anywhere you get your podcast great way to get your morning rolling after a big win as mentioned it's the tie cats 32 the toronto argonauts 19, a big win for Hamilton. Thank you for listening. For Andy Fantuz, I'm Louis B. We'll be back for Tiger Cats pregame presented by Active Green and Ross on Friday as the Tiger Cats are in Toronto. Wishing you a uh, happy Labor Day and a great rest of the weekend. Signing off, I'm Louis B.